Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, it is amazing uh, to have so many people signing up. Um, my name is Solitaire from Futella, and I just wanted to start by saying I am overwhelmed with gratitude for how many of you are giving up an hour of your time to join us in this first of our Imagine Better series. Now, we were expecting to have about 50 Futera clients, some partner organisations join us. Um, you know, that this was our first one, we'd just trial it. And actually, uh, we've had over 350 signatories for this first webinar. Um, and well over 500 of you have signed up for the whole Imagine Better series, which is astounding. So thank Thank you so much. Um, I know what a difficult time it is for people and it fills me with so much hope that the sustainability community is coming together. And in fact, that's been my experience of the last couple of weeks. We are seeing things ramp up from long-standing clients to new clients. We're seeing people thinking in different ways about sustainability and looking to increase their commitments. So um, let me tell you just a little bit about who we are. So um, Futera is a change agency. We are over 70. Our family is over 70 problem solvers and storytellers all around the world. We have offices in London, in Stockholm, in New York and Mexico City. Although right now we feel like we've got 70 little tiny offices <laughs> in lots of different places around, um, around those countries. And our mission is to make sustainability so desirable that it becomes normal. Um, and by sustainability, we mean sustainable development, ESG, purpose and all ways of making the world a better place. How do we do that? We put the logic of commitments and goals and targets, the architecture of change together with the magic of creativity and messaging and the storytelling of change. We put those two aspects together, almost like a hybrid agency. And we do this for some of those amazing clients and partners from working with Google on their big new circularity and climate commitments to helping 350.org with their first above the line advertising campaign for the climate strike. And what I've noticed over the last over the last three weeks of all of our lives being changed is I think that I've noticed um, three big things. First of all is an openness to new ways of thinking and new ways of talking, a bigger openness than I've seen before. Um, suddenly issues, conversations that weren't on the table are on the table about how we're gonna get through this and crucially what's gonna happen next. Secondly, a great deal of compassion and humanity. Um, be that compassion and humanity for the amazing um, healthcare workers all around the world. And I know that on this call, we have people from European countries, from the US, from Mexico, from Canada. We have some from some South Africa and we even have a few very late night folks from Asia. And we know the level of compassion, humanity that there is around um, around the healthcare workers around the world, but also little acts of compassion as well, like when a seven year old walks in on your webinar, that, that actually there is a very human way of working at the moment. And thirdly, an extraordinary optimism. And I've been seeing this extraordinary optimism about what the future may hold, um, even from those within Futella who have been facing some really quite strong challenges at the moment with everything that's going on. And we're actually here to talk about one of those challenges and our optimism and how we're going to face and overcome the big, the great carbon challenge, the great carbon challenge. Um, and in fact, just today I was talking to Nigel Topping. Many of you will know Nigel. He's the high level climate action champion for COP26. We've only just discovered that COP26 is going to be moved to 2021. And I was asking him, does that give us more time? Does that mean that we can, you know, maybe sort of take the pressure off? And he was absolutely adamant. In fact, he's asked me to tell you all the folks on this webinar that absolutely not his view as the high level champion for COP26 is that up 
public expectation of action on carbon is rising. This is what he's seeing. And in fact, tolerance for inaction is, 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 um, is going down. And so what he calls on you to do, he calls on all of us on this, on, on this call, um, he calls upon us to actually up our ambition, increase our ambition for net zero, increase our action and put in place those five year strategies where we're taking action today and tomorrow, where we're immediately bringing down our carbon beyond what we've already done. And so in terms of how to do that, in terms of actually how do you get going on net zero, I'm incredibly pleased to introduce two beloved Futera clients and really good friends, um, uh, Yang, Yaf Ganga Kumaran and Fiona Ball. And they're going to talk a little bit about uh, about what they've done, but then we really want to get some debate going. So what you'll see is you'll see um, a Q&A button to the side of your screen where you can submit questions. We're expecting a lot of questions, so please do submit some questions and then I will ask them of, um, of our panellists. I know some people might not be able to stay for the whole thing, so we will be recording this and we'll make the whole recording available to people afterwards. Um, so don't worry if you miss a bit or if you want to share it with your colleagues. Um, and we'll also produce a write up of the questions and perhaps some of the questions that weren't able to get asked. What I'd recommend is if you know you've got a question, ask it early because we're going to get a lot and there's only so many that I can see at once. So first of all, I'm going to go to Yath. Yath um, from Formula One. Um, we've had a big year with Yath. <laughs> um, and I think he's going to talk a little bit um, now about what what Formula One has done around net zero, a little bit about why, and then later on, we'll start talking about what next. So over to you, yeah. Thanks, Solly, um, and thank you for having me on uh, on this webinar. You know, I guess if we start with the why, why have we created a sustainability strategy? Why did we work with Fatera? Um, we actually did it for overtly commercial and fan reasons. Um, you know, we are, the commercial rights holder for the Formula One World Championship. And it's our business to ensure we're delivering for our stakeholders and we're delivering for our fans. And what we've seen, as you're all aware, I'm sure, is increasingly, particularly young people, are spending more of their time and money with organisations that have some sort of environmental or social purpose. So it's important that we stood for something, given they are the future of our fan base. And also from a commercial perspective, um, commercial partners, sponsors are increasingly wanting to spend, um, to associate themselves with organisations that um, are on the right side of history. Um, and also a lot of our promoters, the organisations that run our races, um, are backed by governments. And as we're seeing, because of the wave of um, the movement from the general public, governments are now putting sustainability more front and centre of their agenda. So it's important for, for us to do this from a uh, fan perspective as well as commercially um, and on top of that clearly it's the right thing to do so it's very much a win-win um, in terms of what we're doing you can see on the slide up in front of you we've got two pillars to our sustainability strategy first is to be net zero carbon as a sport by 2030 by as a sport we mean not just the 500 or so people who work uh, for formula one but all of the activities of our teams from wind tunnel testing in their factories through to transporting all of their kit around the world, through the, the drivers and cars driving around the tracks all year round, all of our activities, all of what our promoters do as well. And then the second pillar is about ensuring that every single one of our races qualifies as a sustainable spectacle by 2025. And when we talk about sustainability, we mean covering the three key pillars of the environment, social and economic. Um, so a much broader uh, piece there, which um, you know has proved very um, positively, um, surprisingly positive for us in that uh, a lot of our promoters, even though they have very different backgrounds, come from very different countries with different emphasis on on sustainability, have all have all uh, signed up to this and are all really trying to, to support us on it. So those are the the what, uh, and as you say, sorry, we can go through later on on how we're going to achieve this. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Can I a little bit of feedback there? Yes. Can I just um, uh, before we move to Fiona, can I just uh, ask you to reflect a little bit on one of the really big moments um, around what net zero means for Formula One, which is when we realised that those cars 
the actual cars on the track, I think were 0.7% of the carbon footprint. Um, and the conversation we had around the fact that they might only be 0.7% of the carbon footprint compared to everything else, they are 100% of the brain print. They're the story that you tell the world and how you worked on bringing the actual Formula One cars into the net zero strategy. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you're right that from a perception standpoint, when people think about Formula One, they think about the cars around the track. But as you say, they're actually a very small part of our footprint. And our, and our footprint overall uh, is 254,000 CO2 equivalent tonnes. Um, if you add in fan travel, we get to 1.9 million per season. That's actually lower than the FIFA World Cup. It's lower than the Olympics. It's multiples lower than companies like Unilever, who get a lot of credibility for sustainability. So our footprint isn't actually that big, as you say, from a brain print perspective, in many ways, we're viewed as the poster child for the internal combustion engine. So it was important that in our plan to be net zero, not only did we address the key areas that contributed to our footprint, such as logistics, but that we also did something which was a step change with the cars themselves, given that's what people think about um, when they think of F1. And you know what we are looking to do is develop advanced sustainable fuels that um, will be applicable not just for our F1 cars and, and have a massively reduced carbon footprint, but also hopefully over time become relevant to the wider road car industry, which is where we can hopefully have a positive impact, not just on sorting out our footprint, but also hopefully having a positive impact in uh, the wider decarbonisation of the automotive industry, given that 99.9% .9 of the over 1 billion vehicles on the planet have an internal combustion engine in them. So if we can create fuels that are then road relevant over time, hopefully we can have a positive impact on, on the wider road car industry as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes. And I think that, oh, apologies. I think that point around how going net zero is both internal about how it's actually affecting your own business, your own strategy, the huge heavy lift that, you, that every business needs to do on that, but also about how as Formula One, you have the ability to influence others, in this case, influencing sort of the pectoral heads of the world in terms of thinking about what's next. And remember at the time when we launched it, there was a quote that if um, that if Formula One can do it, then anyone can. So <laughs> it's brilliant exactly. to have you on board. Thank you, yeah. So I'm gonna move straight over to Fiona as well. Um, right now so that we can hear from uh, Sky and I think particularly that point around footprint and brain print is very relevant for Sky and then we'll get going with some discussion. So Fiona. Okay brilliant so I'm just um, I'm Fiona Ball I'm the director of Sky Bigger Picture which is our sustainability um, team um, at Sky and we launched um, Sky Zero so our campaign and our ambition to be net zero carbon uh, by 2013. If we go on to the next slide for me that would be great. Um, and we, we launched that back in February time to be um, net zero carbon by 2030. And, and here what we wanted to do is really understand that um, as a broadcaster, we have a relatively small carbon footprint. Our carbon footprint in terms of our scope one and two is about 30,000 tonnes of um, tons of carbon. But when we have a look um, at the impact that we have in our scope three, um, it's much larger. About 60% of our carbon emissions relate to the carbon footprint um, from the use of our products in customer homes. And then a further 30% also um, from our supply chain um, across the world. And we really wanted to set a, a target that went across all of those three scopes um, to become um, net zero by 2030. And as part of that, we're following a science-based um, target methodology, and we will half our footprint um, in the next 10 years as we move forward. Um, so if we go to the next slide, it kind of puts it into context with respect to the scope and the ambition that we have. So um, this is there's there's three key um, elements to our um, net zero um, strategy, our sky zero strategy. One is around transforming our business and we want to really fast track this. Um, we've done great things. We've reduced our overall carbon efficiency as a business over the last 10 years by 55 percent. And our idea is to really get net zero um, as a business in the next 10 years, really transforming our business. And this is looking at converting all of our 5000 vehicles that we've got on the road to low carbon emissions over the next 10 years really looking at how we continue to design all of our buildings and particularly any new TV studios um, to be more most sustainable as they can um, and really looking at 
um, producing and designing our products in the most um, energy efficient way we can. But then there's other there's two key other areas to um, our campaign that we need to address in order to reach net zero carbon. One is around using our voice to really drive change. And this is with our 11,000 suppliers. We need to take them on a journey with us and we need to help them understand their journey and set their pathways um, to a low carbon um, lifestyle. And we also need to really um, engage NGOs and other business leaders and policymakers in the need to um, work with us and, and other businesses to achieve net zero. Um, but the real opportunity is really um, what we've been doing for a number of years now at Sky is as a broadcaster, we have the unique ability to really engage and inspire um, our customers and our viewers and our employees to understand um, their impact and to understand what they can also do to um, reduce and, and live lower carbon lifestyles. Um, we've done this and we know it works through campaigns that we've got with WWF around Sky Rainforest Rescue for a number of years and Sky Ocean Rescue, which we launched back in January time, um, has engaged over 50 million people around single use plastics and the need to reduce single use plastics. So we know we have the ability to use our channels and our reach to really inspire um, audiences to understand the issues and to understand what the solutions are that they can take. And then very quickly, if I go on to the next slide and then I will leave it there. The key part for us around transforming our business is really finding those sky zero champions within the business. This is not something that any organisation can do from a CSR team, a sustainability team. It really needs to be owned and lived and breed within the organisation. So we've got four key areas of our business that are really looking at their plans over the next five and ten years and building it within their budget cycles and their and their long term plans. And that's in our operations, our TV productions, our supply chain being key areas of this, um, and, but ones that really do find ways to innovate and change um, and also our products. Um, and this um, is one example of Chris, who's been working um, um, a long time now um, with some of our key suppliers. And it just shows what can happen if a supplier and a business work together well. They've reduced um, and a lot of our suppliers that look at making our, our products the um, energy by half um, at these um, product sites um, in, in China um, through energy efficiency and also um, on-site renewable energy for there. So it just shows what a great thing can be done very quickly. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Fiona. Fiona, we're getting a lot of questions already coming in around uh, the semantic soup of <laughs> net zero, zero, carbon neutrality, carbon positive, carbon negative. I actually have a whole other presentation that I could have done mm. on that in terms of what all of those in terms of what all of those mean. Um, would you just articulate again, what specifically does does net zero mean to Sky and how is it different to sort of carbon neutral or some of the other terms? Sure, so net zero um, means to Sky looking across your whole value chain and taking into account the carbon emissions across your whole value chain, which includes your direct operations, scope one and two, and your scope three operations, where they equate to over 60% of your carbon footprint. So if your emissions in your supply chain or your customer footprint um, or outside your direct business um, is material, you need to include that with any net zero um, target or ambition. Um, the next important piece is, is then you need to set yourselves target across those whole scopes, that whole value chain in terms of absolute carbon reduction. So what are you going to do as a business to reduce your carbon footprint in real terms? And that needs to follow a science based um, kind of methodology um, and the science based methodology that we're following. And we will go through the process of having this um, um, verified by the science based initiative is to halve our footprint in the next 10 years. And that will um, um, keep us below the five and a half degrees warming that we, we all know we need to keep within. Um, then at that point, obviously, you need to continue on your reduction curve in terms of science, um, the science based methodology. But at that point, you can then decide to offset your current uh, emissions in that year into um, um, natural um, carbon um, sinks. 
like mangroves, like rainforests, like trees that would absorb the remaining emissions that you're producing that year. But then you will have to do that each year to remain net zero carbon. Now, that's quite different from carbon neutrality. So we have been carbon neutral um, since 2006, and this was um, great, and we'll continue to do that. But for us, that relates only to our direct business operations. That relates to our scope mm. one and our scope two. For our scope one and two, we have always had targets to reduce our carbon footprint over that time. And then the unavoidable emissions each year that we have, we, we offset. Now, currently in the past, there's been there is a, a process um, that you can offset into voluntary carbon offsets. Those voluntary carbon offsets can be in natural carbon sinks like mangrove, which we, we do offset in, but they can also be in carbon emission reduction projects around the world. So um, wind turbines or um, energy efficient carbon, sto you know, um, carbon stoves around the world. And when you offset, then that's 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 carbon neutrality. But carbon neutrality can um, be confusing because it, because companies can choose the scope of their carbon neutrality. So there's been some you know products that have been carbon neutral, some you know services that have been carbon neutral, but it's very different. It's it's important, but when we talk about net zero carbon. The, um, it's very, very clear. It has to include all material carbon emissions across your value chain, and you have to have um, an absolute carbon reduction in addition to um, investing and in offsetting at the point of zero carbon in natural carbon sinks. Thank you so much for that. That is so helpful for many people who are on the um, who are on the call. Um, we can go into the whole universe of carbon negative, carbon positive, which, by the way, people are using interchangeably, perhaps a little bit later on the call. But let's focus on net zero for now. Now, we've got a question that has come in for Yaf from Claire Poole um, of the Sports uh, Positive. Oh, um, Claire, yeah. Uh, exactly. So I want to come to Claire's question first, because all of us were supposed to be on the panel um, at the Sports um, Positive Summit. <laughs> It, um, a couple of weeks ago amazing event and I know that we've actually got a lot of um, sports organizations who are on this call um, uh, who have signed up to be part of this so um, so yeah what Claire's asked is what do you think some of the biggest challenges or roadblocks to overcome has there been in getting to the commitment to net zero and what do you anticipate are going to be some of your biggest challenges to come yeah good question Claire um some of the biggest challenges in getting to it. I think um, yeah, this was took over 12 months of um, strategizing, putting together the plans, um, but actually the challenge wasn't necessarily putting together the strategy, it was more getting people on board with the whole idea of sustainability and how sustainability could actually be good for us, our sport, as opposed to just being a burden, which I think is how, you know, some people might typically see um, this space uh, who aren't who aren't used to it. So that that was a bit of a challenge to get all the different stakeholders on board. However, I, you know, really pleased to say that we have got all of our stakeholders on board. I think related to that is the number of stakeholders that we have. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're actually a relatively small company, even though we have 500 million fans around the world. We're on five continents every year. There's only 500 people who work for F1. We rely on 22 different event promoters to put on our races who, and they have a lot of staff working for them. Uh, rely on the governing body, the FIA, to set the rules on 10 different teams with 10 very different agendas to uh, to race and to agree to what we're trying to do. We have you know, 200 countries around the world broadcast F1 with very different mindsets and sponsors, again, with different objectives. Um, so getting everyone together and aligned on this is what we're going to do, this is why, this is how it's beneficial to everyone, was, was a bit of a process, but I'm really pleased to say that we've got everyone on board and actually, you know, during the process, we had some of our partners actually try and push us to go even further, which is uh, which is fantastic to see, and I think that'll put us in good stead going forward. In terms of the second part of the question, what will be the challenges going forward? It's all well and good having a nice, um, big, glamorous plan with a strong target, but ultimately it all comes down to execution and you know, the key for us will be to ensure we continue to work well with our partners to, to get them to, to help us to execute. Because as I said, you know, we are a relatively small organisation. A large percentage of our footprint comes from the wider ecosystem. So how do we get our partners to execute when we only have so much control? Um, thankfully, it's, it's going, you know, relatively well 
so far, but it's still early days. But I think that's something that's, that's going to be an initiative process over the coming years. Brilliant. Thank you. Yaf. And we've got another question from you that's come in from Scott Jean, which is which is like it's the hard question. It's the question that everybody's facing, which is what's the balance between that absolute emission reduction that Fiona was talking about yeah. and the sequestration um, in order to get to the net? So how net is net? And yeah. how soon <laughs> do you get to the point where you're nearing zero? Um, because, of course, actually, in some ways, anyone can come become net zero tomorrow right. if they sign a big enough check yeah. to do sequestration. So for you, wh where's the balance and how yeah. soon can you get to a balance that you're happy with? Yeah, so we're at, we're similar to um, what Sky are doing in that we're looking to get to a 50 percent absolute reduction in our carbon um, emissions. and and then we'll, we'll sequester the remaining um, 50 percent. Now, the way that we've calculated that is looking predominantly at, at our biggest um, biggest components of our footprint, which, as we've talked about earlier, isn't actually the cars. It's more of our it's more like our logistics and travel and operations. So we're working through a roadmap for um, making our logistics a lot more efficient, you know, pulling on levers such as transporting less kit and fewer people. Um, so looking at things like remote operations, which means we don't have to take at the moment, you know, a couple hundred people to each of our races to put on the broadcast. Um, Travelling less distance, you know, considering regional hubs at the moment, all of our kits in Europe. So when we go to Australia, we're travelling all the way to Europe. When we go to China, we're coming from Europe to so down to Brazil, etc. What if we had regional hubs in the Americas, in Asia, um, in the Middle East? And then the third lever is around using greener modes of transportation to reduce our logistics. So because we are traveling around the world every, well, typically anyway, every every other week, um, we do use air freight. That, as we all know, is a lot worse from a CO2 perspective than say road, rail, sea. So we'll be looking at modal shift um, to help us in that in that manner. But because we do travel so much and we, you know, we're, we're a sport that wants to go to our fans and wants to remain global, it will always be, be that element of absolute emissions and that's why we won't get to 100 percent absolute reduction but getting to 50 percent we think is aggressive but um credible and then it's about ensuring we do credible things with the remaining 50 percent offsetting which i didn't mention at the beginning we're, we're trying to see if we can use f1 technology to create breakthrough carbon sequestration innovations that are applicable not just to f1 but to the wider world um that can really support support the um you know the dna of f1 which is technological innovation at pace and, and hopefully have a positive impact on on society brilliant thank you we're going to come back to a little bit of that in, in a moment but i want to go straight over to fiona and fiona we're getting a lot of questions similar to that that i asked just asked you which is what were some of the biggest challenges in getting there i think there's a lot of companies online who'd like to get to at least making the commitment to net zero let alone to becoming net zero so what were some of your challenges and how did you overcome them to getting to that commitment um and then um you know some similar questions around how do you measure scope three so scope three for you of course is huge in terms of your um in terms of oh you know i've got my skybox over there in the corner in what is a much less tidy house than it looks like in my background <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, how, how how what were some of the challenges and what might be some of the challenges of measuring that scope three considering how much of a you've got millions of viewers yeah, sure. So I think they're actually interrelated slightly, those questions, because I think the, the biggest challenge for any company when, you, when you're having a look around um, how do I start um, around this? What is the target that's right for us for the business? How do I engage the business um, around this? Is really um, you need to you need to really understand um, and do the measurement piece first. You need to really very clearly understand understand your material impact in terms of carbon, and where the material impact is within your organisation, um, because otherwise we would you know we'll be in a position like. The last probably 10 years where a lot of businesses and and totally right um, have been focusing on their their direct business operations for any kind of environmental sustainability targets or or programs um, so really it it is important to measure um, now we've we've been measuring actually our our scope one two and three emissions for four or five years now and we've been publicly reporting on those so we know that the process is robust we've new, used a number of different organizations to help us 
um, pull that together. Um, and there are, are many organisations, including the Carbon Trust, um, Truecost and ERM that, that can help an organisation really understand what their carbon footprint is. We now have a really good methodology in place now so that we not only understand what our footprint is, but we can do the scenario planning. We can see what changes that we make to our products, to the efficiency of our products will have on our footprint so we can see where best um, our investment and our focus needs to be. Um, we, we know it very accurately. We're very lucky that we know exactly what products we have in the market. We've done life cycle assessments on all of our products in our market. So we know the carbon footprint across their life cycle over the 10 years that they're, they're in use. Um, and we also know when um, our, our products are on, when they're in standby. And, um, and so um, the, the, the carbon impact from those can be measured very, very effectively indeed. Um, and um, we use for the supply chain is the is the interesting bit. Obviously, like many organisations, to to measure the footprint in your supply chain, it's a mixture of um, using data that's available publicly through the carbon disclosure project, um, and working with suppliers that way, or modelling it through um, organisations like True Cost or ERM, ERM that can help model um, that. So number one is to really understand. Um, exactly what your footprint is and then from that you'll be able to tell exactly where you need to um, focus um, your targets on and where you really need to um, engage the business um, to understand that for any net zero um, strategy they need to be fully engaged and that is the biggest challenge and hurdle that I would focus on first is before you kind of have any ideas of presenting carbon reductions and, and you know, in, in line with science-based targets um, to kind of senior management, um, every single part of the business that has a material impact and a, and a material role to play within your your um, your scopes and, and your strategy needs to be engaged and you need to work with them to understand how fast they, they can go and, and what role they, they play. So they're completely bought in to any strategy and any target before it's presented to, to kind of group exec or, or CEO level. Once once you get there, like anything, it's, it's a bit like the COP negotiations when they were saying that COP's been put off to January, uh, you know, um, June next year or whenever it will be. Um, it doesn't actually matter. The important part of any kind of hard work is the hard work that's done before um, the, the final kind of sign off for anything. Brilliant. In fact, you answered quite a few of the questions with that, which were around who could we go and talk to? How do you get accurate data? And uh, and who who internally do you need to get on board? But let, let, let me ask that. Is there anything you would have done differently in terms of getting to the point that you're at? We're going to talk about what happens next in a minute. But is there anything you would have done differently? Is there anyone you'd have gone to speak to earlier? inside your organisation? So anyone that you wish you'd got on side? Um, uh, if you could go back and tell Fiona of a year ago um, some insights around now, what would you have told her? No, I don't think there would have been anything I'd uh, done, done, done differently. I mean, we've been working on our strategy probably 12 or 18 months beforehand, but it never quite seemed right. I mean, we had met our targets um, that we had set back in 2012, a year earlier, and we hadn't reset what our um, our direct business, you know, our direct um, footprint targets would be, and we haven't reset them. Um, and that was because we knew there was something much bigger that we needed to actually address, not our, our targets around our direct operations, but the, the wider kind of scope three. And it was before really it, it was it was too ahead of its time really of trying to work through what it meant for us as an organization i think we had to the the, the timing was something that just worked well for us we really needed to have done sky ocean rescue i think and continue to do that as um our big kind of campaign around plastics to really understand how the business business can transform to a t um, transform how it innovates in, in its design of products, in its supply chain and engages the supply chain to know that a really um, strong and hard target. So our target around single use plastic is to be single um, zero single use plastics in our business by, by 2020, by the end of this year. And we gave ourselves basically a year to do it, just over a year to do it. And that was that was massive. And we didn't really know how we were going to gauge suppliers, our, you know, our product designs in order to achieve that. But that target was that it seemed 
so big and so ambitious, but actually being big and ambitious enabled the business to look very differently and, and to start from scratch and really use innovation in its design to achieve that target. And But having done that for Sky Ocean Rescue and plastics, we then kind of had that ambition that we could do that for something else, for, for carbon emissions. So then when you come as a business to um, set a target that's as ambitious as 2030, like Formula One and Sky have done, you know that actually the business is in the right place. We are the kind of businesses that will innovate and, and look very differently in order to achieve it. So I think for me, I think the timing, I wouldn't have done anything different. You know, I, I might have said I've gone quicker, but actually the time was pretty perfect. Pretty huge. Thank you so much. Um, same question to Yaf, actually. Thinking back, you know, there's a lot of people on this call who are early in the journey. Thinking back over the last um, year or so, what advice would you have given to yourself starting out on this journey to committing to net zero? Uh, I'm, I'm similar to Fiona in that actually it actually works out pretty well for us in that ultimately what does success look like when you when you come up with the strategy? One, you have an ambitious enough plan to really focus the minds to really cut through um to that you have all the relevant key stakeholders across the, the ecosystem that you work in signed up to it and, and and we have that so um so that's been really positive i guess um maybe we would have tried to get some of our stakeholders on side a bit quicker but perhaps they were ones who, who were always going to take a bit longer to uh, to get on the side but no we've been really really pleased with how um things have come together and you know pleasantly surprised by the um the positive coverage that we receive for you know one thing that we do after major campaigns are uh launched is we have a sentiment tracker which looks at press coverage social media coverage fan reaction etc um of the campaign and and it, every campaign gets a score any score above 60 is viewed as very good and um our sustainability strategy launch in the middle of november I uh, got a score of 80, which was the highest that we'd received for any campaign over the last couple of years, even higher than our sort of radical change to our uh, rules and regulations, which went down very well with fans. So it shows you how positively it went. And as you mentioned, Solly, earlier, you know, we had the Green Party coming out saying, you know, F1 is now um, a benchmark for other sports. So couldn't really have got much, much better in um, in that sense. Brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, can I ask you a question? Um, it's coming from uh, Richard Bellas. Hello, Richie. Um, it's about how the financial uh, uh, community has responded to this, if at all. Um, now, you said at the beginning that there was a real drive to do this within Formula One driven for financial and good business reasons. So you're talking now about um, sentiment, 80% sentiment. Um, I think I already knew that, but yeah, feeling really pleased for you on that. 80% um, positive sentiment kind of in the press, on social media, etc. But what about from uh, the money folks? Uh, and what what language are you hearing about yeah. sustainability and net zero from um, uh, investors, owners, uh, sponsors? Yeah, it's been really positive as well. Um, so we're owned by a company called Liberty Media. Um, and in fact, they've been in touch with us uh, to see if we can help them put, you know, work on, on their ESG um, uh, because their investors and the sort of financial community more generally is, is um, taking ESG much more seriously. So. I think the fact that we have come out and we've gone through this whole process and we have a better idea of how it works uh, has proved beneficial to our owners in terms of um, how they speak to investors and the, and the community themselves and how they think about um, doing that piece for themselves and all the other companies that they own. In terms of sponsors uh, of, of Formula One, uh, it's gone down really well. In fact, a number of them really want to partner with us on certain elements of it. So think of Heineken. It was it was. Unfortunately, because there's no racing at the moment, uh, you haven't seen it, but when, when we do get back to racing, um, Heineken are going to be doing a pretty major um, transformation on the plastic side with uh, the cups that are being used by the millions of fans who, you know, who drink Heineken beer at our, um, at our races. Pirelli uh, want, to, want to work with us on the next generation of tyres to make them a lot more uh, sustainable and sort of start thinking about the circular economy there. Um, and we've had some prospective partners, so companies who aren't yet uh, partners of Formula One, who've started to have conversations with us because we have a sustainability strategy. 
So I think I think it's been it's gone down really well. Um, actually, I think yeah, the only side I guess where if you think about financial that's been questioned is how much is this going to cost, um, and the way that we view it is actually we think we're going to save money in the long term, and that we're probably going to bring in new money that we wouldn't otherwise have done. Um, and I remember David Stubbs, who, who I'm sure we all know, you know, he used to stat around with London 2012 for every pound that they spent on sustainability, they brought in 10 pounds in terms of commercial return. So, um, you know, we think actually, yes, you're going to have to invest for the first few years, but you will see that return longer term as well. Brilliant. Well, um, almost perfectly, we've had almost very similar question that's come in for Fiona from um, Richard at the sustainability team in the BBC. And Richard's asking, uh, did you fully cost all of this up beforehand? Did you take it to the board, sort of end to end, this is how much it's going to cost? Or did you ask people to go for a leap of faith in terms of actually what the resource cost was going to be for this over time? Um, so, so it's a little bit of both. So, yes, we have costed out over the next 10 years, at least, what this will cost as a business um, in order to transform our business and to make the absolute carbon reductions that we have. Um, there are there are a lot of caveats to that, though, because we don't know what the carbon market is going to be like in 10 years time. And there's a lot of work still to be done around what we need to do around investing in carbon sinks now in order for the carbon sinks or carbon capture and storage to be available in 10 mm -hmm. years time for the um, number of companies that are going to be wanting to um, you know invest and use that as, um, as as part of their strategy but yes in terms of our business transformation and the work that we need to do as an organization um, we do have a, a costed up 10-year um, budget Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, not too much of a leap of faith. So actually, the, what, what you're raising there about carbon sinks, there's been a lot of questions that have come in around the, um, around, should we say, the offsetting part of this. And we all use this language interchangeably and probably not always that help, helpfully, because when we're talking about net zero, we're actually talking about carbon sinks. You know, this is how it was defined um, by the IPCC in 2018. Um, uh, good quality carbon sinks where you actually can feel confident that you are sequestering the carbon rather than sort of traditional offsetting etc do you have any advice for people on actually finding that so that you can feel really confident that you are going net zero um, over time and in a way where that carbon sink without sequestration is going to be maintained because one of the other things which we know about sequestration is um, and particularly nature-based solutions is that it's not just for a year you've got to hold on to that carbon in that nature-based solution for a long time so any advice for people on finding really good quality carbon sinks I'll come to you Yaf. Well I think um, we're still too early in our um, execution plan uh, planning um, phase to give anything where we're speaking as as experts. Um, mm. What we are trying to do at the moment is focus very much on absolute carbon reduction, first and foremost. Yeah. We, you know, I'm sure everyone finds it that if you start talking about um, offsetting too early, then people think that's sort of an easy get out for them. Yeah. And for us, we want to fundamentally change the way that people operate and also their mindset when they when they go into work. So our focus has actually been around um, absolute carbon reduction, first and foremost. I don't know if Fiona is able to better answer yeah. that question. Good quality sinks, Fiona. So yeah, so um, at the moment we're we when we're looking at um, offsetting in good um, carbon natural, you know, uh, quality sinks, we are we're talking at about a, a relatively small amount of uh, carbon offsets that we're looking for because at the moment we've still got our commitments around scope one and two, but we. We'll be looking at the scope three um, a little bit later down and I think um, a lot of changes will have to happen in the carbon market in order for people for the availability of these good quality carbon offsets to be available in the kind of numbers that we're looking for and actually a lot of work has to be done now um, with large businesses that are looking at um, looking at this and I know a lot are already looking at um, what they can do to start investing now for the future um, so there are for, for there, there are not many out there, I would say, in terms of good quality natural carbon sinks, but there are good standards that are in place um, for people to ensure that the offsets that they do purchase 
um, are, are what they say and and do um, offset the same amount of carbon mm. in the same vintage year also. So in the same year yeah. that you are producing your emissions as well, which is also important. But I would suggest um, it is a very complex um, and not something that I'm an expert on, but I would use a broker and a really we use natural capital partners. We've got a good partnership with them and we've worked with them over the last 10 years to really help understand what the projects are that are available um, uh, you know, for organisations and I, I will do that um, personally. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, 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 we do look at, which is nothing, part, not part of our um, official offsetting as part of our campaigns that we do and the work that we do with Sky Rainforest Rescue and Sky Ocean Rescue, we are investing in um, with, with WWF, our, our, our partners there, in looking at how we can um, pilot new carbon um, capture and, uh, you know, new carbon um, kind of capture um, areas. So we're, we're doing a big pilot study at the moment with um, seagrass across all of the um, yeah. um, seas across the UK because they obviously do capture an awful lot um, of carbon, you know, more than sort of like 35 times the amount of carbon that is captured in rainforests. And this kind of piloting and um, projects are really important to happen now so that we know what can be done um, for when we need, um, yeah. you know, these natural carbon sinks in 10 years time. Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. In fact, actually, yes, we've had quite a few um, questions about negative emission technologies. So um, not just the natural um, carbon sinks, the, the nature based solutions, which, of course, are going to be such a significant part of this. But you also mm -hmm. mentioned around um, we've all seen um, some extraordinary technology coming out from um, some Formula One pa partners, um, some real speed tech. Um, do you think as well as some of the speed tech that we're seeing um, coming out from uh, Formula One partners on, on COVID solutions, do you think we're going to see the same on negative emission technologies? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I think, you know, the, the, what, what, you know, what COVID has shown in terms of, you know, Mercedes coming up with this new breathing aid solution within a week and producing it is just how much um, intellect there is on the engineering and scientific side within Formula One, but also how quickly they they work. And ultimately, that, that is sort of the point I was alluding to earlier around the DNA of F1 is technological innovation at pace. Um, you know, this whole idea of mass prototype, you know, prototyping and then getting it out to market as quickly as possible is something that has been taught in very small ways to um, other industries. You know, and if you think about sort of technologies that have helped from a carbon perspective, um, Williams used F1 aerodynamic technology to create what's known as aerofoil technology, which has gone into every Sainsbury's fridge in the UK and led to a 15% reduction in the carbon emissions of, of Sainsbury's as a company. Um, that's a very small example of how we can apply the technology, you know, the, the bleeding edge technology in Formula One to, you know, the wider sustainability agenda. So I wouldn't be surprised, and as a, and it is actually part of our plan. Um, albeit it's not it's not in the base case in terms of um, putting numbers against it in terms of carbon reduction. It's part of our plan to try and develop applied technology based on F1 that can help with you know taking carbon out of um, out of the atmosphere. Now I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I think it's probably later in the 20s. Um, mm -hmm. But we have certainly a number of engineers who are, are very senior who are working in F1 who, or have recently just left F1 who are very keen to take part in that and so as we um, develop those plans I wouldn't be surprised if if you see sort of a dedicated team looking at that which would be fantastic. That's, that's super exciting. Right keeping an eye on time we're going to do a, qu a quick fire round so I'm just going to come to you guys and see how many of these questions I can get through. Um, so coming to you Fiona, um, question from Jeremy, how do you get staff on board with it? Staff engagement around net zero, how important is it that everyone's on board? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's really important that everybody's on board. I mean, when we launched our, our target, we um, launched to all of the employees, telling them about our target, telling them about what it meant. Um, we've got loads of plans, um, uh, you know, um, in, um, in, in the making around how we can have Sky 
um, zero champions, how we can um, get lots of people involved, getting them understanding what their own footprints are, what they can do in the office and what they can do at home. So yes, you need to, this is this is a campaign that lives and breathes uh, within the organisation and staff are critical to that. We've got, you know, 32,000 employees and they're all part of that footprint. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, yeah, this is a big question for a quick fire um, round, but Omar has asked, post this current COVID-19 crisis that we're that we're facing, are you worried that um, there's going to be a reprioritisation just on the economic and that actually some of this uh, big net zero part that's been such a part of Formula One, um, because you guys, you guys are going to have a pressure. You're not currently racing at the moment. It's yeah. suddenly all just going to be about the racing and forget the forget the climate. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, we've, we've announced that this is, you know, one of our key priorities for the next 10 years. And, you know, the thing with COVID is obviously it's an event based um, disruption as opposed to structural. So, you know, who knows how long it will take, but certainly within a year, you know, we should be back, you know, businesses should be back to, to normal. And as we said, it's a 10 year plan. We're still working behind the scenes on our sustainability efforts. So um, there shouldn't be a disruption in terms of the long term, clearly for the next couple of months. You know, certain things have slowed down, um, but the priority still remains the same. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, back to Fiona. Fiona, um, Laura has asked, what specific skills do you think are needed by, from someone in your job in terms of actually getting this through? Um, if, um, if any of the companies online are trying to recruit for someone who can do this, what kind of skills should they be looking for? Um, you definitely need need some background around um, environmental issues and understanding um, what the material issues are for the organisations. So you, you definitely do need that kind of background. But the number one thing I would say is that the biggest skill set you need is the ability to really engage and and um, and um, work with lots of different parts of the organisation to get them understanding what their role is and get them bought in. So really, you need somebody who can really show leadership and inspire people to 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 get involved. Really, brilliant. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, back to Yaf. Yaf, really big question um, about climate adaptation. Actually, so less than about net, net zero. But um, the races go to some places which might be quite seriously subject to um, climate instability, um, extreme weather events, etc. How much is that part of your plan? In, in part of our plan in terms of? Well, just overall in terms of how much does climate adaptation play in Formula One's plan for the future? Well, it, it definitely um, plays a part in terms of when we have races. So, um, you know, for example, it's public knowledge so I can talk about it you know we're, we're looking at having a race in Miami um, clearly they have a stormy season so we want to avoid that and so that impacts when we might want to, to have the race during the year um, you know there are more local climate issues that our promoters that our governments uh, deal with or want um, and so as we move forward we will look to see if it makes sense for us to work with them on a more local basis um, but clearly it, ha it has to fit into our wider sustainability strategy. So that, that will be done on, on a more case by case basis. Brilliant. Thank you. So there's actually there was a question for me on here, which was quite exciting. <laughs> um, that actually leads to some of the questions that I'd like to finish um, with you on. So the question to Futera is sort of um, what do we see as Futera as kind of beyond net zero? Um, some of this brand print, uh, brain print conversation, um, which is so deep, um, uh, close to my heart. And we've been using, if you tell her, the terminology of scope X. If you've got scope one and scope two and scope three, which are all cut within your value chain, and of course scope three being huge scope, upstream and downstream in your value chain, and taking responsibility within that, that's all still <coughs> within your value chain. Scope X for Futera is societal scale scope people, organisations, other businesses, government lobbying that might be not anyone you actually touch, not a customer or a supplier, um, but actually the societies in which we live. So in terms of both of you are organisations with a huge reach, you reach a great deal of the public, you're very influential in other companies, um, you've got a big media profile. Um, uh, how can you best leverage that scope X 
to actually trying to change the societal response to climate change. Because what we all know is it's not possible to be a net zero business really in a continuing uh, increase of carbon in the world. There's not really much point in doing that if we don't actually collectively bring um, our emissions down. So uh, coming to YAF, what do you think the role of um, a Formula One could be in Scope X in actually changing the wider conversation about climate change far beyond your direct or indirect footprint? Yeah, and I think the big thing for us is ultimately we are a, a sort of a global media platform. You know, we have 500 million fans, million people watch our races every other week. Um, so it's about talking about that story in a way that's relevant, I guess, to the racing. You know, what you don't want to do is come across as preachy because you're just going to turn people off. Um, so it's about doing it in a way that links in to the wider story of F1, and this is where I think this technological innovation piece comes in quite nicely. Um, and then doing that with our partners, and as I mentioned, because we're linked to governments, um, we can sort of start working with them. But I think it's using our media platform as a way to tell that story, but in a way that's related to the entertainment that is our racing. So you can start to get people in almost through the back door. Brilliant. So so both the, the, the people, the half a billion who watch Formula One and then also you did mention relationship with the governments there that actually there's a role kind of in scope X to influence governments do you think? Yeah I, th I think that's sort of um, again we're so early in our journeys that I don't want it to sound too grandiose but you know as this becomes as we gain more credibility through our execution then you know that's something that I think becomes more and more important with how we talk to our government partners um, about this you know to give an example with our race promotion contracts, we're putting in sustainability terms that our promoters have to meet to ensure they have a Formula One race going forward. That starts to lead to questions with the governments of the countries you're going to around what they're doing on sustainability more generally. Wow, that's that brilliant. Um, Fiona, very similar question to you. Like many of us are sitting at home, we're very aware how big a part Sky is of our lives. <laughs> I'm spending a lot of time with Sky right now. Um, in terms of that Scopex, your ability to influence culture and society even beyond your own um, consumers, even beyond your own supply chain. Um, what role do you think? Do you think there is a responsibility for businesses to do that? Oh my goodness, there's a massive responsibility for businesses to do it. I mean that is our responsibility as a broadcaster is to definitely use our voice and to and to support and help millions of people um, to to be inspired to switch to lower carbon lifestyles and and connect them with um, understanding what their footprints are, but understanding what the solutions are. I mean, we've we've done it in a similar way with Sky um, Ocean Ventures, which was an um, um, a venture that we um, invest in, which supports young and up and coming entrepreneurs and, and new businesses around bringing the solutions to market for consumers to use around single use plastics. And that's exactly what we've got to do around um, around carbon and carbon lifestyles. So yeah, number one, I mean, that's why two massive parts of our strategy is around using our voice and using our voice to inspire and engage other businesses, policymakers, governments, um, anybody really that has a significant role. This is going to take everybody to come together, other, lots of different businesses in order to have the right um, the right me measures in place for businesses to be able to transform their, their organisation. And then the other big part of ours is around mobilising people, you know, giving them the information through our channels, through documentaries, through news, really helping them to understand the urgency of the situation as well, why we need to act and we need to act now and that there's this 10 year window that we, we do need to make significant changes to our lifestyles, um, but also inspiring them to understand that every small change when we add it up does make a, a significant difference um, and that everybody has a part to play in that. So that is, I would say, our number one. If we're going to reach Sky Zero, we're going to we have to address um, Scope X. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. So we're almost at time. I'm going to ask just one final piece of advice from both of you. We've got a lot of companies on this webinar who would like to follow in your footsteps, um, who'd like 2030, although maybe they're talking about 2050 right now, um, from everything which you've learned. Like, obviously, your one piece of advice would be work with Futella. But if you had another piece of advice <laughs> for everybody on this um, on this call about going net zero, um, you know, 20 seconds each, coming to you first, Yaf, what would your piece of advice be? I think it, it immediately go in with 
the mindset of here are the benefits to come out of it and how sustainability should be embedded into your just general corporate business as usual strategy rather than viewing sustainability as an additional burden because there are so many opportunities that will come out of uh, you know essentially being on the right side of history and I think that's going in with that mentality you can immediately hopefully have more of an opportunity of changing the mindsets of the senior stakeholders that you need to convince. Brilliant. Thank you Fiona. Um, I would say, um, you know, 2030 is not going to be necessarily possible for everybody. I mean, we we are, we, you know, Yath and I are working in an organisation that we, you know, it is going to be possible. We we can innovate and we can change in that timescale. That's not going to be the case for every sector. Um, but I would say really understand what your impact is, where the material parts of the impact are in your organisation and go and speak to those people within the organisation and get their buy-in first. And then when you do have a strategy um, with, with people from the organisation built in, be ambitious as you can. Really go with the big, the biggest ambition, and and don't you know don't sell yourself short. Once once you've sold it in, that's that's got to be the level you go at. Well, I have to say, having worked with both of you for some time, um, that would be my learning from you both is that you've kept that ambition high over long periods of time. The tenacity, the commitment, um, the absolute not taking no for an answer in terms of getting this through is something that's been a joy to work with. With that time, I'm going to say thank you so very much to everyone who's attending. The video of this will be available. There is an Imagine Better series where you'll be talking about Gen um, Z, the under 21s. We'll be talking about about branding, we're going to be talking about optimism, we've just been talking about actually how you as an individual can live more sustainably. So we've got a whole set of, of these coming up. I want to thank Yath and Fiona so very much for making this first one so brilliant. Um, uh, I just, I'm such a privilege to spend this time with the sustainability community online. I'm sorry I didn't get around all of the questions, there were so many of them. Um, it makes me feel so happy to know that we can still have these conversations even when there's such such a big change happening in the world. So thank you. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world and I'll see you really soon.